Every one of us in this room finds ourselves waiting for something. Can you say amen? Some are waiting to finish school or perhaps some are waiting for the birth of a child in your family. Some are waiting. In fact, today, today's Matthew and Desiree's due date, and that's why they're not here. So they might, they might give birth any, any day now. Some are waiting to move into a new house one day or purchase a vehicle. Some parents here may be waiting for their kids to graduate from school, or some may be waiting for their health situation to change or to improve. There's someone that is in an intensive care unit of a hospital today and they are, and their loved ones are waiting for things to turn around. Perhaps someone had a successful surgery and the doctors are extremely pleased with the procedure and now it's a matter of time to wait for the body to repair and heal itself. There are even some of us who were so blessed to have had the privilege of having a loving parent or relative or friend that has gone before us and we have been separated by a death and now we are waiting to reunite with them and see them again soon. The truth is that the majority of our life is spent waiting. If we stop to consider some of life's major events, we can see that they are definitely preceded by much waiting. We all had to wait a while for our very first car. We had to wait for our first house. For all of those that are married and started a family, that, including, that included a waiting period. Or maybe you have started your own business and, and you had to wait. The truth is that so much of our life is spent waiting. In fact, the person who experiences the greatest amounts of success is the person that waits well. You see, it seems like a lot of people have a weight problem. And I'm not talking about W-E-I-G-H-T. Don't look at me like that. I'm talking about a W-A-I-T problem. On occasion, I'll stumble across an article or a book, a television interview or a video that I feel is of significant spiritual value. In the past, I brought such information to the pulpit in hopes that it will have a significant similar impact. I will always scrutinize the material and the author the best I can to vet the material because there's so much material out there that is not Christ-centered. I refuse and I also try my best to never allow a great orator, entertaining lecture, intriguing material to win over my attention unless it is Christ-centered. With that being said, at the same time, I've learned that humility is a great asset in our ascension towards spiritual maturity. I certainly do not want to miss out on what God is intending to convey to me. I do not want to miss out on what God has spoken to others if I have God's permission to become an audience to it or if he has ordained that the material be shared with the body of Christ. There are some Christians, they feel like they know it all. They won't listen to anybody. They won't read anything. They will just walk in their own personal revelation. And I was there at one time, and I understood that I had to swallow my pride and say, God does speak to other people. I'm not the only one that hears from God. Amen? And we have to humble ourselves and say, God may speak something to somebody else that will benefit me. So I've got to remain in a hum humble attitude when you hear a pastor preaching or someone teaching. Several years ago, I stumbled across a Christian TV interview with an author whose book, sub whose book subject and the title caught my attention. I listened in as best I could, and I really connected with the bit of content and I had, that I had been exposed to. The title of the book was intriguing to me. It was titled, The Sacred Slow. I've decided to take the time and the effort to read and go over some of this material so that a greater number of us would benefit from it. So if you'd like to buy the book or download it so you can read it for yourself or follow along, this is what it looks like. I'm gonna ask, there it is, oh wow, sharp. The Sacred Slow, a holy departure from what she calls fast faith. We're beginning this series today titled The Sacred Slow because so many of us have a problem waiting. Since so many people find themselves impatient while they wait, 
frustrated while they wait, angry while they wait, anxious and confused, perhaps doubting at times, it would be best to have a dialogue about what our posture as believers should be in our waiting times. And the truth is that the majority of times our anger, our frustration, our confusion, our anxiety, or our doubt stems from an uncertainty about how things will turn out. When you're not sure how things are going to turn out, you get nervous. And honestly, a lot of the reason why we have trouble waiting on God, waiting upon the Lord, waiting for the miracle, waiting for the outcome, waiting for the victory, is because our motives are many times selfish. We, at the end of the day, don't really want the Lord's will to be done. We want our desire to come to pass. And when the clock starts running and we don't see what we want to see, we get anxious, we get frustrated, we begin to doubt, we get get confused or sometimes we're waiting for God to prove something the other day I asked God God you know man if you heal this person you're going to get a lot of glory I mean I'm not telling you what to do it's not my job but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, if you were to heal this person, you would get so much attention and so much glory. You know what's going to happen. And he said this to me. I don't do things to prove myself. I do things to reveal myself. And I'm like, oh, yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Sometimes we want God to move a certain way in our life and we get anxious in the wait because we actually want him to prove something to somebody. Sometimes we want to prove something to other people. I remember a young man coming to this church and he was ready to preach. Just got saved on fire for God. He was ready to send everyone to hell. Come on, come on, pastor, I'm ready. He actually got frustrated and at times angry at me. And I'm like, son, not yet. Sometimes those that God has placed in your life as a spiritual authority see something down the road that you don't see. They see danger. Now, if it were up to me, I would have started driving at 10 years old because I was infatuated with cars. And I love to drive, you know, and my my they wouldn't let me drive. And some of us, we would love to start a family at nine years old. We'd love to drive at 10 years old, but we have to wait because our immaturity or our lack of experience. And when you're in a church and you have a pastor that has been pastoring for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, I promise you they've seen some stuff that you have not seen. And sometimes the answer is not no, but it's not yet. And we have to wait. And God's delay is not God's denial. And we have to learn that. And so sometimes we ask God for things selfishly or we want him to move fast. And God chooses how he reveals himself in that season. So if he heals someone from a disease or an intensive care unit, he has chosen to reveal himself as healer. Can you say amen? But if you have someone like my brother Drew who prayed and we prayed for his dad to be healed, my sister Mimi who prayed and cried for God to heal her mother, her mother, we have to allow God to reveal himself as the resurrection. It's his choice because he's God and he's sovereign. And in every situation, every circumstance, we learn how to wait well. My brother Drew's waiting to see his dad again. My sister Mimi's waiting to see her mom again. I'm waiting to see my mom again. I'm waiting to see my sister again. I'm learning to wait well. And uh, all that happened, no, COVID didn't kill him. God just pushed a fast forward button and he called them home. And now they're advanced in an advanced stage. Now they're in the land of the living. And we're in the land of the dying. We have to let God be sovereign enough to do what he needs to do and wants to do in order to reveal himself, not to give us what we desire. Because our ways are not like his. His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. 
And in the waiting, he's doing something. He's doing something to you. And something should be happening to you and to me when we wait. The truth is, the majority of times, our anger, our frustration, our confusion, our anxiety, our doubt stems from that uncertainty. We just don't know what's going to happen. We just are afraid we're not going to get the outcome that we want. When time steps in the way of you receiving what you're expecting, it seems to threaten what you're expecting. When time steps in the way of receiving what you want or praying for, it seems to threaten that. But waiting, and especially waiting on God, has its benefits and its purpose. Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run, and they will not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Can you say amen to to flying like an eagle? Can you say amen? Amen to running and never getting tired and never fainting. But can you say amen to waiting? As we read this text, it's apparent that a precursor to renewed strength is waiting on the Lord. I find that we often make the mistake of waiting on others or waiting on opportunities. And the Bible does not say those that wait upon their pastor shall renew their strength. It does not say those that wait upon their husband or their wives shall renew their strength. It certainly does not say those that wait upon their children shall renew their strength. Can you say amen, parents? It says says those that wait upon the Lord. In fact, can you say amen if you've experienced that at times Waiting on other people or waiting on circumstances can have the opposite effect and forget about it renewing your strength. It can really wear you out. Listen to the premise of the book as stated in a portion I've extracted from the foreword of the book. And I've asked them to put this on the screen as well so we can read it together. Here we go. In a world, I have to wait. (laughs) Who said that? Smart guy. Somebody's listening. (laughs) If it doesn't come, that's okay. I throw these things at these guys like at the last minute. They do a phenomenal job every Sunday after Sunday, Sunday. You have no idea what some of us put them through. (laughs) And uh, when something usually doesn't pan out, it's usually the sender and not the recipient. I'm going to read it anyway and just trust me. In a world where the words fast, instant, automatic, rapid, speedy, ready-made, and prefabricated are marketed as that which is preferable and desirable mistakenly, there has developed a spirituality that trumpets the instantaneous, the quick, the immediate, and the right now as being signs of the hand of God. This has resulted in what the author of the book calls fast faith. You and I live in a microwave world. You can file your taxes, get your refund before they even process the taxes. You can get your food in just a few minutes. Everything's fast. You can download things. And sometimes when we come to church and we come to to worship God and, and live a Christian life, we expect the same kind of speed. We expect a microwave faith. I'm gonna come to church this Sunday and God's gonna answer my prayer. You've been a rear end for 30 years of your life and you want him to answer your prayer in 30 minutes. It didn't work that way. And God has waited on many of us. Can you say amen? Because we were stubborn, we were lost, and he's still waiting on some of us to grow up. He has every right to allow us to wait on him. Wait graciously. Wait patiently. Wait lovingly. Now, Isaiah just told us that waiting upon the Lord is a recipe for renewed strength. 
That is because waiting incorporates ingredients that give rise to faith. Faith then in turn moves the hand of God. When I wait, what I do is I anticipate. If I'm waiting for payday on Friday, I'm anticipating that I'll get paid, amen? When I'm waiting to walk again after an accident, I am anticipating recovery. I am anticipating healing. Anticipation is the action of anticipating something, expectation or prediction. So when I anticipate, I'm predicting or I'm expecting. Notice the verse says, those that wait upon the Lord. When your weight is upon the Lord, your anticipation is that he will come through for you. Your prediction is that he will reveal himself to you. When you wait on the Lord, that waiting causes you to be married to hope. I'm waiting for this to happen. I'm actually hoping for this to happen. I'm predicting this to happen. And in those processes, in those exercises of hoping and anticipating and expecting, your faith is built up. And faith is the evidence of things not seen. Upon the Lord, wait upon the Lord, that God will move. When you wait upon the Lord, your expectation is that God will move. Your prediction is one of victory, so you cannot wait on the Lord without having hope. It is impossible to divorce hope from your life when you're waiting upon the Lord. Now, you can get discouraged sometimes when you're waiting if you think in your mind that you're waiting on the Lord, but in fact, you're waiting on religion. On, uh, maybe you're waiting on some doctrine that your parents or your denomination handed, you, handed down to you. I've, I've, I've discovered that sometimes I've waited, uh, I thought I was waiting on the Lord, but I was actually waiting on something that somebody else told me. I thought it was scriptural. I thought it was the way God was, and I really wasn't waiting upon the Lord. I was waiting upon a doctrine or waiting upon a mis uh, an erroneous thought. I, and I've known myself and a lot of Christians that are not renewed in strength because they are waiting upon some mixed up or messed up hand-me-down doctrine or message that someone told them and they did not seek out the Lord on their own. Pastor TC, we were talking last night on the phone. Pastor TC said, Pastor, do you know what the word wait there means? He did a word study on the word wait. He pointed out that it means to abide to abide. So let's, we wouldn't be scripturally incorrect if we said, those that abide in the Lord shall renew their strength. I looked up the word abide. I thought just, I'm going to look, look, look at it just in case it offers something interesting. And it did. To abide means to accept or to act in accordance with and then it gives an example, to act in accordance with a rule, to act in accordance with a decision, or to act in accordance with a recommendation. So when I abide in the Lord, I'm accepting a rule of God, a decision that God has made, or recommendation that God has made. Abide is to accept in accordance. Like an example would be a sentence, I said I would abide by their decision. Listen to this. This was a little surprising. Some common synonyms of abide are bear, to bear something, to endure something, to stand, to suffer. The word suffer is a synonym with the word abide. Another one is the word tolerate. While all these words mean to put up with something that's trying or painful, abide suggests acceptance without resistance or protest. Those that abide in the Lord and suffer, bear, endure, can stand. Accepting without resistance or protest will renew their strength. Most times, we wait and we throw a temper tantrum. Can you say amen? We get distracted. John 15, 7 says this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. 
What a powerful verse. The Bible says, if you ask what you desire, he will give it to you. No, it doesn't say that. It says, if you abide in God and God abides in you, then you can ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Because I, I, I used to ask for different kinds of things when I was younger and I visited God, but I didn't abide in him. And I would let him visit me, but he did not abide in me. That's when I wanted cars and houses and di different materialistic things. But as I've come to abide in him and he abides in me, my desires are totally different. So I can't expect God to give me the desires of my heart if I'm not abiding in him because I'm on the wrong, I might desire the wrong thing. And he loves me too much to give me the wrong thing because he's a good God all the time. But when I learn his thought and I learn his mind and his heart and, and, and I allow him to come into my mind and my thought and we become together and, and, and there's a unity there, then my desires become his desires. And then I believe and it's like I abide. I'm in acceptance in accordance with the rules and the decisions and the recommendations that he makes. And, and then I'm able to stand and suffer and tolerate and bear and endure without protest or without resistance. John 15 goes on to say in the preceding verses, abide in me and I in you. And Jesus says, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit for without me, you can do nothing. If you were here a couple of Sundays ago, you witnessed me making the statement that there are times that I get so stressed out or in a tough situation that I don't at times even know what to pray or say. And the situation is so pressing that I have to pull away and I get on my knees and I tell God, I just need you. Time out on the situation, time out on the circumstance, time out on what's not working, what needs to happen, on all that stuff, overload for me right now, just let me feel your presence. I'm gonna stop asking you for this right now, God. I'm gonna stop asking you for that right now. I'm gonna even stop hoping for any kind of outcome. I just can't take another step and I can't take another breath unless I sense that you are with me. I know in theory that you were there. I know in word that you were there, but I need to know it in a sensory manner. Let me hear you breathe. Let me hear you talk, say something, move. Let me feel you, touch me the way you can. Just let me feel you near. I've noticed that circumstances and situations can keep me from feeling God. Can you say amen? Tough circumstances, tough situations can keep us distracted and can keep us from feeling God's presence. But I've also learned that God can keep me from feeling certain situations and circumstances. There are times that one will keep you from the other and I get to choose which one does by abiding. So a tough circumstance comes, a tough situation comes, and it threatens to knock everything down, knock everything out, knock me out. And I say, hold on, I'm getting in God's presence. And his presence distracts me from the threat at hand. And in the presence of God, the Bible tells you and me there is fullness of joy. If you're always stressed out, if you're always losing sleep, if you're always crying, if you, if you never have peace, if, you, if you're just... Just in chaos, that means you're not spending time in his presence. Because the Bible says, in his presence is the fullness of joy. And one of you is lying. And I've staked my career on that it's you. <laughs> what does it look like to wait on the Lord? I found three forms of waiting that are very typical in our lives and we don't even maybe realize that what we're doing, but if we would understand that it's a form of waiting, we might be able to endure and bear and stand and suffer a little better. Did you know that fighting is a form of waiting? Because when you fight, you're hoping for an outcome 
And when you wait on the Lord and abide in the Lord, you're predicting that he's going to come through. You're predicting the victory. So fighting is a form of waiting because you are hoping for an outcome and you're predicting and anticipating the victory. Did you know that trusting is a form of waiting? Listen closely. Because I've heard everybody, a lot of people say, I trust the Lord. Trusting. This is what trusting means. Showing or tending to have a belief in a person's honesty or sincerity. That's what trusting means. Showing or tending to have a belief in a person's honesty, sincerity, and then the definition is followed by these two words, not suspicious. How many times have we been suspicious of God? I wonder what he's going to do. I wonder what he's going to do. We must ask ourselves, do I trust God? Now you're going to get all mixed up and messed up if you think that having faith in God is the same thing as trusting in God. A lot of Christians have faith in God, but they don't trust him. Faith is, can he? Trust is, will he? Big difference. And when you are separated by time from your victory, you need to ask yourself, do I trust him? I know God can do anything. I know he can heal because he healed my neighbor. But what will he do for me now? What am I learning now? What dimension is God trying to get me to see or for me to operate in now? Pastor TC is going to bring a message on dimensions and how we complicate our lives if we simplify our lives and just think that there are just the dimensions that we see. When you cross the threshold into eternity and you become a spiritual being and you become a son or daughter of God, you now have a, a, a plethora of dimensions and you live in eternity and you exist in a realm that is a, a realm that you need to rely for God to reveal things to you. And so sometimes we go through really tough things here on earth and our victory depends on what dimension we can understand or what dimension we can operate in. And so we need to be open to understanding that God has different dimensions. Fighting is a form of waiting. Trusting is a form of waiting and confession is a form of waiting. Listen to what Romans 10, 9 says. If you declare with your mouth, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Confession is a form of waiting because it is the verbalizing of an expectation. It's the verbalization of an accordance of a rule or a decision or recommendation from God. We see in scripture that waiting was a huge part of ex executing God's plan. Before the walls of Jericho came tumbling down, they walked around the walls and then they let out a shout and the walls came tumbling down. They had to wait several days. When Jesus died on Calvary, we had to wait three days for him to be resurrected. Philippians 3 verse 20 says this, for our citizenship is in heaven from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. First Corinthians first seven, verse, chapter one, verse seven says, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians 1.10 says, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Jude chapter 121 says this, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And Romans 8.23 says, and not only his, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. 
The Bible even says that the earth is awaiting and has groans of deliverance. The pestilences, the, the diseases, the viruses, the thorns, the, 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 the erratic and chaotic behavior that, that, that has erupted ever since God has removed his presence uh, from the garden it causes a lot of chaos in weather patterns and earthquakes and tornadoes and, and uh, volcanoes and, and hurricanes and all these kind of things. And the Bible even tells us that earth waits for its redemption. What if you and I could come to a place where instead of tolerating the weight, we would celebrate the weight. We would enjoy the weight. We would understand the weight. We would be less angry, less anxious. And what if we would enjoy the weight that we could exercise our faith in the weight that God would actually give us credit for our faith in the weight. What if we acted like waiting on God was equivalent to receiving from God? Um, Jesse, could you come up here for a second, for a couple of, couple of minutes? And John, could you come up here for a couple of minutes? And it, yeah, just stand like that so they see, can see your face and then... So did you ever take drama in high school or anything like that? Do you, do you act? You can act? Yeah, that's what your wife told me. You were, she said you were a good actor. I'm just kidding. And I know you're, you're an actor because you're a clown. You, you, you play clown all the time. <laughs> Okay, so here I am, and I'm going to promise them a million dollars. Promise you I'm going to give you a million dollars. I promise you I'm going to give you a million dollars. I haven't given it to them yet. It's only a promise. So, Jesse, you're going to be the guy that's excited about the million dollars, okay? And you're going to, you're going to anticipate me giving you the million dollars. In fact, so you need to put your anticipation happy face is, is, it, is that it? You got it? <laughs> okay. No, not your bully face. <laughs> you're excited. You're waiting okay. for me to give you the money. You're excited. You, on the other hand, John, time is ticking, and I told you I was going to give you a million dollars, and it's already like three years later. You still see no money, and you're getting frustrated. Yeah, see, do you see that face? <laughs> that face. <laughs> In fact, you're, you're anxious and you're frustrated. Now that's turning into anger. And you're starting to get angry with me. You're starting to question. No. <laughs> you can't touch me. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you got one guy waiting in anticipation and excited. Actually, he's, you're writing down a budget. You're going to plan on how you're spending that money. You're, Venmo. Yeah. Venmo. Venmo no, don't. Don't focus on me giving you the money. Focus on you getting the money. <laughs> okay. What are you going to do when you get it? That's what you're excited about. You were like worried you're not going to get it. <laughs> so then Jesse is out driving around and here comes a big old 18 wheeler <laughs> and it just plows him and just bam and he dies okay it's a little better than what I expected <laughs> okay might get nominated for, for something so did you do you understand that he died waiting? He died waiting. He, if he were to die, he'd be dead in anxiety and fear. Do you know that when you die waiting, God gives you credit for that faith you had while you were waiting? And when you act like you already received it, even though you don't have it, but you're, you're saying to yourself, it's, it's coming and it's just as good because he said it, because he said he was with me and he would never, because he said that he would be my provider because he said he was my healer. You can, let's do a resurrection here. <laughs> yeah, I knew you fell asleep there for a minute. <laughs> he was waiting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, thank you, angry person. <laughs> and what we have here is we have Hebrews 11. 
these all died in faith. And it talks about all these people that waited on God. And they waited for God's promise, but they never actually received it. They actually expired. Their expiration date came to pass, and they all died in faith. The Bible says, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, they were assured of them, and they embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And they didn't let the situation get to them because they knew that he who promised was greater. And that if the clock keeps ticking, it doesn't make God any less God because it's not on your clock or anybody's clock, but that we're headed towards eternity and his promises are yes and amen. And a lot of times our anxieties and frustrations like stem from that selfishness and that motive like, God, I want to see you move now. I want a desired un- outcome now. I want you to hurry. I want you to prove something to the world or I want to prove something to someone else. So let this happen. We have to wait on God and wait well. I'm gonna end with this quote from the book and then we'll get into the book Sunday after next. The book seems to introduce a corrective call away from the addiction of experiences and a call into developing intimacy with God. There are things in our journey with God that best occur over time. Don't get me wrong. This is not the book, this is me. Experiences are good. But we have to be very careful that we don't substitute intimacy with experiences. There are a lot of people coming to church today to hear a word, to hear a favorite song, to hear the preacher say something that will tantalize them and, 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 and move them. And they're looking for an experience. And we have to be careful that we do not come to expect intimacy through experiences rather than encounters with God. Your life is going to change with encounters from God. Experiences are good. I hope this message made you think, made you feel something, made you ask questions. I hope so. But the real work is not what you experience inside the building of a, of, 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 uh, inside the four walls of a building. The real work is not what you experience when you hear your favorite worship song. The real work happens when you allow God to reveal himself in your heart. I've been to many, many churches and many, many services, and I've heard the most awesome services, but the most transformative moments of my life have been spent behind the steering wheel of my car when I'm driving and texting (laughs) and speeding. (laughs) I'm getting better. And God speaks to me in the shower and on the commode. How many, how many have moments in the commode? One. God's not like, oh, <laughs> you wait till you get out. I'm not, I'm not going there. How many of you have ever been in a club? Well, don't raise your hand. <laughs> But just pretend, like in your, in your spirit, raise your hand. How many of you have ever been in a club? You're drunk, you're high, you're partying, you're shaking your thing or whatever it is going on. What happens in clubs? I don't know. My wife tells me what happens in clubs. <laughs> I've never been to one. And you feel God telling you something. Well, God can't be in a club. He can be wherever he wants to be. You know what, I, I, I had a drunk person witness to me and, and I, I've had people come back to church because they were in a bar and a drunk person ministered. Well, that wasn't God, that was the devil. God can't minister through a drunk person. He sure can. He can minister through a jack-o'-lantern donkey. I didn't want to say the A-S-S. He, he uses you sometimes. What do you mean he can't use a drunk person? 
You got you to let God be God. Wherever he wants to be God. However he wants to be God. Don't limit him. He'll come, he'll get you where you're at, if you're his. Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and he keeps getting up. But a wicked man falls when, when disaster comes or strikes. The word calamity is used there. Meaning that if you're his, you're going to fall, maybe. But he's going to get you back up. Because you're his. Because you're abiding. Because you're waiting. And I know there's sometimes I fall and I'm like, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> and sometimes like I don't have energy to get up. Sometimes I don't even want to get up. Because I know when I get up, I got to go back to living life a certain way. I got to perform for people, for myself, for religion. And sometimes you find yourself down on the ground like Jesse was. And you don't even want to get up. But at those times, I've known it was just a matter of time that he was going to come for me. And he was going to pick me up. And I'll be like, I'll wait here. I'll wait here in my confusion. Because daddy's coming. I'll wait here, devil. I'll wait here in my addiction. Because my father's coming. I'll wait here going through this divorce. I'll wait. I'll wait out this bankruptcy. I'll wait out this cancer. Because I'm waiting upon the Lord. And my strength will be renewed. So how much more mileage how much more can we show to the world that we are more than conquerors we want to be more than conquerors without anything to conquer we all want a resurrection but nobody wants to die we all want to know god is healer but we don't want to get sick i was talking to to pastor tc and sharon we were talking about going through things suffering you know and I said, man, if you, if you told me, Pastor Albert, I guarantee you will never go through a fire, ever, ever. You'd be comfortable. Nothing will ever go wrong and no fires in your life at all. But you won't have God's presence. I'd be like, I can't handle that. Sign me up for every fire. <laughs> Every bit of problem, every trial, every giant that must sign me up for all of that if you can assure me that his presence will be with me. Moses told God, if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. The Bible says, lest the Lord build a house, they that build it labor in vain. There are only things, there are things that you can do only with his presence by your side. And we don't get to choose what those things are. We just get to choose not what, but we get to choose who. Not what we go through, but who we trust in. And the Bible says that if you trust and you wait on the Lord, he will renew our strength. So as we get into the book, we'll discover some of the things that we think we're waiting on the Lord, but we're actually waiting on missed appointments. And when you have an appointment that disses you, like, have you heard that? Oh, he dissed me. <laughs> That's a disappointment. But when you have an appointment with God and you expect scripturally truth, you can't be disappointed. Disappointed. You will get what God promised you. Amen? So would you stand with me? And uh, we'll be dismissed. Um, I do want to give you an opportunity um, if you're here and you um, are wanting to make a decision today and draw a line in the sand and say, you know what, God, I'm going to wait on you. You, you could have come into church with a problem, a big burden, something that's been weighing you down, something that's been frustrating you, something that's keeping you up at night, something that's causing you to medicate yourself. Um, but you want to say right now, your word says to me, God, those that wait upon the Lord 
will renew their strength. So Lord, today I resign as the general manager of the universe, as supervisor of my life, and you know, not, not, to, not to quote Carrie Underwood, but uh, Jesus take the wheel. <laughs> Maybe somebody will understand what I'm trying to say. <laughs> You know, you know, Jesus, from here on out, I trust you. So I'm going to ask them to play this song that says, draw me, Lord, and I will run to you. And if you've made a decision today during the preaching of the word or something, step out of your chair and just come and just release that to the Lord and allow him to know that you're going to wait on him. And from here on out, you're going to have trust in him and his word and his promises. And I'll run after you. Before we leave, I have two invitations as they play the song again in the background quietly. I believe that God is drawing someone to himself this morning in this building, in this room. And so I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. And as we do that, if you're here and you feel like, you know, I, I, I feel like God is drawing me, drawing me to him, to his presence. I don't know all the details about what he's expecting me, uh, what's expected of me to, to live like a good Christian or whatever. I just feel a tugging in my heart that I feel like God is just trying to draw me to him and calling me. And all the events of my life up to now, my bad childhood, my, my, my trouble with the law, my addictions, my chaotic family, my dis, disorder, what all these things have just led up to a point into to my life to bring me to a place where I surrender. And, and I didn't even know that while I was going through all that stuff, what I was really doing was just waiting for today, uh, for the day that God would actually 
without even words, just somehow invite me to himself. Just can't explain it. It's not a word that I hear. It's not something that I'm even physically sensing, just something in my heart that's telling me he wants me. He wants me closer. He wants to reveal himself to me. He wants me to understand him. He wants me to abide in him. And from this day forward, God is asking you to give yourself to him and he's promising you his presence and the strength and your strength will be renewed as an eagle. You will run and not faint. You will walk and not be weary and you'll be renewed. And he will give you wings of an eagle to soar and to fly. If that's you, if you feel that's you, as people's eyes are closed and their heads are bowed, would you just lift your hand quickly right there at your chair? Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Please don't think that this was just a nice song or, you know, the guy up there is just doing what he's being paid to do. This is actually an invitation from, from the throne of God. This, was, this day was marked in God's calendar. And before today, he told me, I'm going to draw some people to me tomorrow. I'm going to draw them to me. You be obedient. You say what you need to say. You play this song, and I'm going I'm to work in their heart. So I want to tell you, today is the first day of the rest of your life. The second invitation is for those of you that are tired and weary, and, and you've been a Christian for a long time, and but you've just kind of been frustrated and, and you know things haven't been going the way you planned and you find yourself defeated and you forgot what it was like to dream. You forgot what it was like to even love again. And you're here today and saying, Pastor, as eyes are closed and heads are bowed, you're saying, I, I, I sign up uh, to wait on the Lord. I'm going to wait on the Lord. If that's you, if you made a decision today to wait on the Lord anew, to refresh yourself. Just lift your hand right there where you're at real quickly. Okay, awesome. Father, we just trust in your word and in your presence. Your word is enough. We don't need any shows, any lights, maybe not even goosebumps. We just need a promise. We just need a word from somebody that's bigger than us and stronger than us. We just need to hear it's going to be okay. We just need to trust in someone stronger than us. Most of us, when we grew up, we were really quite disappointed because the ones we thought we could trust, we couldn't. In fact, instead of helping us, they rejected us. They pushed us aside. Some, some of our folks chose a pill over, over their own kid. So, some, some fathers chose a six pack over their own son. Some, some just used their children. And so we were left alone trying to find worth and value and true love. And from that time we would be very suspicious of anybody that said I love you because we've heard those words before and those words were attached to very hurtful and wounding experiences so we have a wall a thick wall around our heart and we try the best we can to let our kids in our wife in our husband but we don't let anybody completely Today, Father, you've offered a second chance to people. You've offered to be a fresh, a breath air. You've offered to give them a second win. You've offered them to give and put their trust in you and you would renew their strength. And I know you're going to do it because you've done it for me and you've done it for so many others. And you're not a man that would lie, but you keep your promises. I thank you for all those that lifted their hands, that you would go through this much trouble to prepare this message for them because you 
are anxious. And you've been, you've been waiting. You've been waiting for them to say, okay, God, yes, I will believe. Yes, God, I will love. I will give my heart to you. I don't understand it all. In fact, most of it confuses me. But I will. If you draw me to yourself, I will run after you. So we thank you for today, a day of new beginnings. And as you do so often, when these people that lifted their hands leave this place, you're going to continue your work. This is going to turn into just into much more than just an experience at church. It's going to turn into a, 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 a born again experience, a new creation, a work. And for that, we give you all the honor and the glory. I thank you right now for the testimonies that we'll hear next week, or even this afternoon or, or next month about how lives were changed because they surrendered to you. You're an awesome God. You're the only one that can do these things. You've tried yourself year after year. You've proven yourself. Help us to renew our strength by waiting upon you. Whatever the situation was that we came in that was seeming to destroy us or burden us, help us to wait well. Take a deep breath and know that if we abide in you, we can, we can just count it assuredly that victory is ours. If we give you permission to spell out that victory whichever way, as long as we know that you're with us, and we thank you for that. And we give you all the honor and all the glory. And we ask you these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Would you give the Lord a clap?